The federal government announces millions for Aboriginal training. An assault at the Thunder Bay Jail leads to charges. And skydivers hit the skies over the Slate River Valley. Good evening and thank you for joining us. A new Government of Canada Skills and Partnership Fund was announced today worth millions of dollars. The new deal would see Matawa First Nations members receive training when it comes to the mining sector in the Ring of Fire. Courtney Rutherford has the details. The overall development of the Ring of Fire is undoubtedly a multi-year initiative and with the federal government adding $5.9 million to the pot, Aboriginal students will have a brand new opportunity in their hands. The program titled the Ring of Fire Aboriginal Training Alliance will cover specialized training for 260 students who live near the massive mineral deposit. This is not a project that we want to have outsourced to the rest of the, the world. Obviously we'll invite their help and welcome it where it's strategic and necessary. But for the most part, for my part, as the minister responsible for FedNor uh, and Ring of Fire, to make sure that Northern Ontario's footprint and face is very much on, uh, on Ring of Fire. The training program is all thanks to a partnership between Ottawa, Confederation College and the Kiknomaga Kikenjuan Employment and Training Services. The objective is to provide skill development, labour market participation and efficient training tailored around the Ring of Fire. The trainees will be guided long term with hopes of sustaining career pathways in the mineral and mining sectors for years to come. We think it'll grow to more than a thousand over a period of time. Uh, we've, we've got, we know that we've worked a lot in those communities. And there's more than a thousand people that have indicated their interest in further education and developing their skills, so they'll be directly applicable to mining, but also other related types of field. When will it start? Uh, I think it's starting right now, literally, literally the next couple of weeks. The announcement was the first by Kenora MP Greg Rickford since being named Minister of Science and Technology and the federal point man for the Ring of Fire. He says skills training is the best way to include First Nations communities in the Ring of Fire development, adding that it's important that future employees are homegrown talent looking to improve the economic fortunes, not only in First Nations communities, but cities and towns across northwestern Ontario. Courtney Rutherford, TBT News. The Regional Energy Task Force welcomes an announcement today on the East-West Tie Line. The province has hired a company to design and construct the new power line from Thunder Bay to Wawa that is viewed as crucial for this region. Task Force co-chair Larry Hebert says the group is also looking forward to the unveiling of an energy plan for the areas north of Dryden. That's expected to, ha to happen at the end of next week. The Ontario Power Authority has been working on a plan to address record levels of mining development and energy needs. The draft plan calls for a new transmission line from the Dryden area that will connect First Nations communities that rely on diesel and the Ring of Fire. Hebert believes the North is going to drive the economy in the province, but says mines won't be built with a reliable energy grid. Hebert says their message continues to fall on deaf ears. We've got to start connecting these First Nations, get that transmission system up there, develop the industry, whether it be forest, tourism, mining, and get these things going. And the good news is there's so much hydro potential up there that it'll be able to bring that power out to our area, uh, to their own area up north, and to the rest of Ontario, and perhaps even to neighboring uh, states and provinces. Hebert's also looking for good news from the Ministry of Energy at this month's AMO conference. He's hopeful an announcement will be made at that time that will see Thunder Bay, the generating station, converted to natural gas. Well, there has been some good news on the energy front. NOMA is frustrated with meetings it had with ministry officials yesterday. And there were more questions following a provincial energy meeting last night. A public open house was held in Thunder Bay on Ontario's long-term energy plan, but Ministry of Energy spokespersons wouldn't comment on what the plan is for the city or the region. The Ontario Power Authority and the Independent Electricity System Operator have turned in a report on regional energy to the minister. It outlines ways to power the ring of fire and remote northern communities. But spokespersons at the meeting wouldn't comment on those plans or how the region's energy needs will be met. Thunder Bay Superior North MP Bruce Heyer was one of those frustrated people in attendance. He called the meeting deeply disturbing, run by very defensive people, who provided what he calls non-answers. 
There's nothing on the lines to the Ring of Fire. There's nothing on the proposed lines or not to uh, remote communities. And a really big one is there's a proposed line from the Pickle Lake area uh, down the east side of Lake Nipigon. Um, it's just uh, inexcusable if this is supposed to be a planning exercise that there's no opportunity to see those proposals and comment upon them. Ministry officials say the open house was to let people know that a review of the long-term energy plan is underway. The public could not comment on the plan at last night's meeting. Instead, people have to visit the environmental registry or mail a letter to the ministry. Two members of Ontario PC leader Tim Hudak's caucus are telling him to allow a leadership review at a policy conference in London next month. Some grassroots Tories have already filed motions requesting a leadership vote. The PCs won just one seat out of the five by-elections held in Ontario last week. Hudak is out of the country on vacation, but supporters point out he received almost 79% support when they held a mandatory leadership review after losing the 2011 election. City police were called to the Thunder Bay District Jail yesterday to deal with an alleged assault on a prisoner there. The incident occurred at about 3.30 in the afternoon. Police spokesperson Chris Adams says two inmates aged 45 and 25 have been charged with assault. The victim was a 58-year-old man and it appears the injuries were minor as he was not sent to hospital. Another inmate at the jail alerted TBT News about the incident, who said it sparked a code blue lockdown, which led to several other altercations in the prison cells. A spokesperson at the Ministry of Community Safety and Correctional Services would not comment on that. He did confirm that an incident took place yesterday at the jail in which an inmate was injured. But because the matter is under investigation by the ministry and the police, he says it would be inappropriate to provide any further details. Thunder Bay Police continue their efforts to locate a man who's been charged with numerous offenses involving a child. Last week, a Canada-wide arrest warrant was issued for the alleged sexual predator. 62-year-old Arthur Joseph Lyons is wanted for sexual assault, sexual interference and breach of probation. So far, one victim has come forward and police say quite often in these types of cases there are others. So far, the suspect has eluded police. Anyone with information as to his whereabouts is asked to call Thunder Bay Police or Crime Stoppers. Given the fact that uh, he was put out for location, he knows he's wanted for these charges, there is a very good possibility he could have fled out of town. Um, they are proceeding with just the one instance right now that dates back into late J July. Adams reminds parents to be very aware of who they leave their children with. The Ontario College of Teachers has revoked the license of a former Thunder Bay Area principal after finding he turned a blind eye to allegations of sexual abuse against his ex-boyfriend who also worked at the school. Jack Perrin has been barred from reapplying for his teaching license for at least five years. The college's disciplinary committee found Perrin's inaction made him an accomplice to the abuse alleged to have taken place between 2003 and 2006. The Child and Family Services Act requires anyone working closely with children to report any suspicion of abuse against a child. The organization that helped found the local chapter of Meals on Wheels says it was shocked by news. The program is under review. The Lakehead Social Planning Council identified a community need for nutritional meals at home more than 40 years ago. LSPC Board Chair Mary Casoris says the organization found out about the potential change, like many others, through the media. The Red Cross is working on a proposal to take over the Meals on Wheels program from the city. The move would save city taxpayers about $100,000 a year. Kazoris calls the Red Cross a wonderful organization and believes the program fits with their mandate, but she does have some concerns. That it's done right and that there's the continuity of the, uh, of the quality of the, of the service and again that uh, a, a non-for-profit is not absorbing additional costs that they're not, they're not going to be in the red as a result of, of offering this service. Kazora says the program is not only important for the meals but also social interaction for the clients and volunteers. All of the city's discussions about the Meals on Wheels program have been held behind closed doors. The food shelves at the Regional Food Distribution Association are nearly empty, forcing organizers to issue a desperate plea for help. The RFDA supplies food to more than three dozen food banks across the city and throughout northwestern Ontario. As of this week, the company is completely out of their top 10 most needed goods. 
Those typically include foods that are high in protein and make easy meals for families. Each month, the RFDA serves over 13,000 families, and they're asking the public to do whatever they can to help fill the gap before it gets even worse. Well, what's going to happen is we do have a reserve of money that has been donated for, for purchasing, so we will go on a buying spree, which puts a lot of strain on our budget later on in the year, where we, we have to go back to the public and ask for donations. So we will go shopping. We will try to uh, do the best we can. And we may not be able to buy as much as we can to, to fill all of the hampers, but uh, we're anticipating a good response from the public. The RFDA is encouraging the public to look inside their pantry for extra food and drop by their Syndicate Avenue headquarters to donate throughout the week. A fundraiser has now been set up in honor of a dog killed by a black bear while protecting its owner this past weekend. Spyro was a miniature schnauzer that died on Saturday at Sandbar Lake Provincial Park near Ignace. He was one of two dogs walking with 42-year-old Trevor Miller when they were attacked repeatedly by a predatory black bear. Miller calls Spyro a hero, saying the dog sacrificed itself so that he and the other dog could escape to safety. The Bay Credit Union on Algoma Street has created a fundraiser in Spyro's honor. All money raised will go to New Hope Dog Rescue. Miller's friend Sylvia Kaluski came up with the idea as a way to commemorate Spyro's bravery and encourage local dog lovers to help save other dogs. Well, local thrill seekers have been hitting the rides at the CLE this week. But there's an even bigger thrill ride happening just outside the city. Adventure skydiving is back for another year and people are flocking to their temporary drop zone for a chance to fall through the sky. And today, Nate Jones spoke with some first-time jumpers. It's not for everyone, but those who give it a chance say it's more exhilarating than scary. It's skydiving. And Drop Zone operator Tim Eason says people seem to get more than a cheap thrill from this extreme sport. I think it's challenging themselves. More so than the actual experience of the jump, which is amazing, it's the sense of accomplishment of actually doing something that so few people have actually had it in them to do. There were many first-timers getting ready to take the plunge. After the signing of a waiver and some brief instruction, it's time to gear up and hit the plane. Any last words? I'm really excited. I've never done it before. And um, I'm really looking forward to taking a jump and trying it out. I think it's going to be pretty scary at first, but I'm looking forward to it. It should be a really good time. In these little planes, it can take between 20 and 30 minutes to get to a height of 11,000 feet. It takes a lot less time to get back down. Jumpers hit speeds of over 200 kilometers an hour within 68 seconds. At 11,000 feet, that's about a 45-second freefall. The parachute ride down to Slate River Valley offers a beautiful view above these farmers' fields. It was amazing and scary all at the same time. And uh, it's great because you're, you're in the airplane and you're climbing and you're climbing. And you go, oh, we look pretty high. And then your, your tandem partner goes, oh, well, we're only at 400 feet. We still have like, you know, 10 more thousand to go. And you're like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> You know, as soon as you were out the door, you weren't nervous anymore. It was just, the free fall was easily the best part. It's just so fast, it's so exhilarating. I loved it. It was so much fun. Once safely on the ground, both agreed they would do it again and would recommend it to others. Adventure skydiving will be in the city till Saturday, and there are still spots available for those willing to take a chance. Prices start at about $250 per person. Nate Jones, TBT News. I have to say, not a chance I'm doing that. Oh, well, you were there two years ago when I yeah, uh, you're jumped out of that plane. I <laughs> it's scary at first, but once you're on the ground, you're glad you did it. There are lots I'll of take people, your word for it. There's lots of people who would like me to do it, but without a parachute. <laughs> oh, that's not true. <laughs> One of them is Barry, but <laughs> what are you going to do? Anyway, uh, turning to weather now, uh, Sarah, little blustery out there. Shades of September already. Yeah, um, quite a bit of wind today. I don't know, I know nothing about skydiving, so I have no idea how that would affect anyone jumping out of a plane today. But I know that we did uh, get up to about 20 degrees, mostly cloudy conditions as well. Those winds coming from the west-northwest and gusting up to about 36 kilometers per hour, which was bringing that blustery uh, conditions that some people were talking about today. Currently across the region, some scattered showers in some area. Uh, 13 degrees in Red Lake at the moment. 
mid to low teens, a bit warmer in Atacocan. They're currently sitting at about 17 degrees. If you are heading out to the Border Cats game tonight, that gets underway at 7.05. Mix of sun and clouds, so shouldn't be any uh, reason to bring an umbrella. Don't quote me on that. Um, also at 7 o'clock, Senior Little League Championship. That is going on at Baseball Central. Uh, Thunder Bay is taking on Cape Breton. So uh, two choices of baseball games. Uh, but the weather should uh, be quite pleasant for either one, should you decide to go. Thunder Bay tonight, uh, passing shower or two and getting a bit cool, dropping down to about 10 degrees. Those winds coming from the west-southwest and dying down a little bit, gusting up to about 24 kilometers uh, per hour. We can see into tomorrow that uh, possibility of some pop-up showers is still likely, but into the weekend we have some nice pleasant weather coming our way. But I'll have more on that later on in the news hour. Thanks, Sarah. Well, two of the country's biggest unions are joining forces. We have that story and more for you coming up as your Thursday news hour continues. These are what union leaders call challenging times for the labor movement. Membership overall is up recently, but only in the public sector. In
Two of Canada's biggest unions are coming together to form one big labour powerhouse in the coming weeks. The Communications Energy and Paper Workers Union and the Canadian Auto Workers Union are joining forces and will represent 300,000 workers. And today, as Aaron Saltzman reports, there was talk of who would lead it. It's a rare union leader who takes a pass on a bully pulpit. Ken Luenza is no exception, though not for much longer. I'm retiring because it's in the best interest of our union. Luenza's union, the Canadian Auto Workers, is merging with the Communications, Energy and Paper Workers Union. The new super union called Unifor will have more than 300,000 members spanning 20 sectors of the economy. I ask myself, do I want to start a job and recognize I can't complete the job? Because this is not a one-year two-year project. These are what union leaders call challenging times for the labour movement. Membership overall is up recently, but only in the public sector. In the private sector, unionized workers account for barely 16% of the Canadian workforce. 30 years ago, it was nearly double that figure. The loss in union members mirrors a drop in manufacturing jobs due in varying degrees to a lower Canadian dollar, globalization and outsourcing. Analysts say a larger, more diversified union will strengthen its bargaining position. They're going to have more influence at the bargaining table with employers, uh, with elected officials at the federal provincial government. Uh, professors will pay more attention to them. The media will pay more attention to them just because they're bigger. They've got that scale, that size. Sentiments echoed by auto workers. I think it's good. Uh, obviously, the more people, the, the stronger we are together. We'll be twice as strong. Well, way more members. The leader of those members is expected to be this man. Well, the idea behind Unifor is, is, is for working people to play offense instead of defense. Um, we need to have the debate in this country about what type of jobs we want, what type of role working people should be playing. The new union will hold its first convention Labor Day weekend. Aaron Saltzman, CBC News, Toronto. Police in Nova Scotia say they've arrested two males in connection with the Retea Parsons case. She's the teenager who was taken off life support after a suicide attempt in April. Carolyn Ray has the latest from Halifax. It was the case that made headlines around the world. A Halifax teen dead after telling her parents she had been sexually assaulted at a party by several boys. Retea Parsons was just 16 when the alleged incident occurred. She told her family a photo of that day was being spread online and she was being tormented by bullies. How fast this destroyed my daughter was just unbelievable. She, she never recovered from it. Then this morning, a phone call. Two males in custody. I felt like crying, I felt like running, I, I just felt like, and at the same time, you know, you feel, uh, you feel sad because my daughter's never going to know that sense of justice. She'll never know that. Initially, the RCMP and Halifax police closed the case. Her family, heartbroken, were vocal in their campaign for justice. Her mother said at the time that police failed her daughter. She wanted someone to believe her. And nobody did. It sparked protests, vigils, and threats of vigilantism. The province called for investigations into the school board and the local hospital where Retea was treated in the mental health unit. As the furor grew, a tip came in. Police reopened the file. Uh, the investigators are certainly going to want to take as much time as necessary, and that would go for any investigation, let alone uh, Retea Parsons, because this was a tragic event. Uh, police, uh, this has been played out in the public. Obviously, I just want to say how pleased we are to see that progress is being made. Uh, I hope uh, uh, this will uh, provide some measure of comfort to the, the family. Police say they don't know yet if any more arrests will be made, but with intense scrutiny around the world, they're trying to keep every detail possible under wraps. Carolyn Ray, CBC News, Halifax. A Quebec judge today granted creditor protection to the company at the center of that deadly train derailment in Lac Megantique. And as Catherine Cullen reports, the company's financial troubles are just beginning. The physical devastation is staggering. The emotional devastation, incalculable. And now the company many hoped would shoulder much of the financial burden says it just doesn't have enough money to pay. Montreal, Maine and Atlantic asked for and received protection from its creditors. The company insists this is the fairest way to proceed. I think it will speed up the process. 
you will have one single forum within which all the claims will be assessed. MMNA estimates cleanup from the disaster will cost more than $200 million. The government says taxpayers shouldn't shoulder the burden, that the company should pay. And then there's lawsuits from families of victims, businesses destroyed, and those displaced. The judge here today called MMNA's behavior throughout this tragedy lamentable. He also said creditor protection was necessary to avoid what he called judicial anarchy, as everyone who wants money from the company rushes to claim what's left. Lack Megantic's lawyer agrees creditor protection is a better option. We just have to control what will happen and prevent any uh, splitting of the money and legal fees and thousands of uh, claim from everybody. But there are still a lot of questions about who will get how much from MMNA. Among the concerned, employees who are being asked to maintain essential rail service. We're going to have a hawk's eye. We're going to follow this company very, very closely to make sure that they do things correctly. Those launching lawsuits on behalf of the victims say they won't be deterred by this latest move, that they'll go after MMNA's parent company, as well as others with links to the train derailment. We intend to continue and uh, look at every avenue in order to make sure that people receive the compensation that is due to them. But just exactly how much money can be found to pay for this disaster is a question no one is yet able to answer. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Montreal. Prime Minister Stephen Harper toured the Irving oil refinery in St. John's today. And as Robert Jones reports, the visit raised questions about relations between Ottawa and New Brunswick. Irving oil refinery employees were lined up for the third time since April for a political photo shoot to mark the Energy East Pipeline project. This time for a visit by Prime Minister Stephen Harper, who allowed himself to be filmed by news organizations, but not questioned even though there are lots of New Brunswick issues to ask about. Uh, let me say one other thing while I'm at it, uh, uh, colleagues in the media, friends in the media. Harper raised um, and answered issues all by himself at a brief refinery podium visit, but no one was invited to participate in any way, not even Premier David Allward. Mr. Premier, I have to say that it was truly an honour to be standing beside you as you worked very hard for this whole this whole project. Normally, federal conservatives like St. John MP Rodney Weston make a point to credit Allward for his advocacy of the Energy East pipeline, as have others. New Brunswick has made such a commitment to the feasibility of being able to ship Alberta product here. In June, Alberta's Conservative Premier Allison Redford lavished Allward with praise for his work on the pipeline idea, as did new federal cabinet New Brunswick kingpin Rob Moore the pipeline announcement itself just last week. I want to thank Premier Allward. We know that he has been steadfast in his resolve on this project. This is an extremely exciting development, I think, that we have um, people in the business community uh, putting together uh, projects that really uh, bring the benefits of our growing energy industry across the country. But Harper barely mentioned Allward. During his tour of the refinery, the Premier was made to trail behind the Prime Minister, raising questions whether recent New Brunswick complaints about Ottawa are taking a toll on the relationship. Premier Albert has a growing list of criticisms about how federal policy treats New Brunswick, from EI reform to La Pro compensation to health care funding, most recently job training. But it's unclear whether that has become an irritant with the Prime Minister because he was not answering any questions on those issues or anything else. Robert Jones, CBC News, St. John. Well, it was a relatively strong day on the markets. Let's take a look at the numbers. In Toronto, the TSX jumped 140 points to 12,552. The Dow Jones advanced 27 points to 15,498. And the Nasdaq increased 15 points to 3,669. The Canadian dollar is up 9 tenths to close at 96.86 cents U.S. Gold increased $24.60 to $1,209 an ounce. And crude slipped 97 cents to $103.40 per barrel.
Well, if you have a chance, you should really make your way down to Baseball Central this evening. Uh, if, if tonight's final at the Senior Little League Championships is anything like this afternoon's semifinal, it's going to be a good one. I'm hoping it'll be a great one. I'm really hoping There's that it is. There's plenty of reasons why you should head down to the old ballpark at Baseball Central. Are you going to tell us all about them? Seven to nine. I'll do that right now, Mr. Good. Bonanza. <laughs> the Cape Breton Cubs have advanced to tonight's final on the Canadian Senior Little, Little, Little League Championships. <laughs> Over at Baseball Central, they needed an extra inning to slip past Saskatchewan 6-5. to five. That means they'll take on the winner of this afternoon's other semifinal between the Thunder Bay Selects and Valley Field Quebec. Ryan Bonazzo has your highlights. The Thunder Bay Selects in a rematch with the only team yet to beat them in the tournament, the Valley Field Elites out of Quebec. This time with a berth in the finals at stake, the Elites strike first, scoring three in the top of the first. Felix Beauchamp hits what should be an inning-ending ground ball, but the throw from short is a little bit wide. Brandon Gillies can't make the tag. In comes a run. Skip to the third, Valley Field up 3-1. Thunder Bay starter Bryson Obey in trouble with two on and nobody out, facing Nicholas Poirier. That is tattooed to left. See you later. A three-run shot for Poirier that puts the elites in the driver's seat. They'd lead 7-1 midway through the frame. But the selects get to Cedric Levesque in the home half. Obey brings Ryan Nason in from third. Call it an RBI double for Obey. Thunder Bay responds with a four-run inning of their own. The trail 7-5 to the fourth. It's now 8-7 Valley Field. Benjamin Roos on in relief. The first batter he faces is Obey, who takes him deep to left field. Nason and Brennan Tianhara come trotting home. Obey had a sensational day at the plate, finishing three for four with a walk and four runs batted in. Thunder Bay puts up five in the inning to pull ahead 11 to eight. But back come the elites in the fifth. Maxime Quenville knocks in a pair. Two batters later, Jean-Philippe Mercier benefits from some shoddy Thunder Bay defense. Two more come across. This game was absolutely wild. It sounds like a football score. It's 13-13 in the bottom of the seventh when Valley Field elects to give Dan Del Paggio a free pass to load the bases. So that brings catcher Tyler Minoletti to the plate with one out and Frederick Chazon walks in the winning run. The Selects walk off the Elites 14-13 in the seventh. Valley Field's coaches and players can't believe it as that pitch was very close. They have words for the umpires as they leave the field. Thunder Bay manager Mike McAllister says that's baseball. Uh, definitely a close pitch, but I mean, uh, fact is it's called the ball and, and uh, yeah, it, it uh, led to a walk that got us the winning run. What do you guys have to do tonight? Uh, what has to happen in order for you to beat Cape Breton yet again? Throw strikes, play defense. We didn't do that today. and that's what Ryan Bonazzo, TBT Sports. Uh, we didn't pitch too bad. But the Thunder Bay Border Cats will try and snap an eight-game losing streak at Port Arthur Stadium tonight when they open a two-game series with the Wisconsin Woodchucks. The Cats were swept in a pair of seven-inning games last night, 10-1 and 12-3 by the Eau Claire Express. Their second half record is now 6-25. and The game begins at 7.05. Meanwhile, this afternoon, Patrick Sharp's annual charity golf tournament took place at the Fort William Country Club. Sharp teamed up with older brother Chris, his financial advisor Grant Skinner from Winnipeg, and former Toronto Maple Leaf captain Doug Gilmore. Sharp says they had a pretty good day on the course, and it got even better when he won the putting competition. But the most important part is the money that's raised for the George Jeffrey Children's Centre. One of the stops that we made uh, with the Stanley Cup and to see the expression on the kids' faces, to see how appreciative they were and, and the families that were involved. Uh, you could see how much a 5, 10, 15 minute visit made to them. Um, we thought that with a little bit of hard work we could, we could put an event together and do a lot of good things. So we have a great time doing it and we raise a lot of money for, for the centre. It's something that we all have done and um, I'm in the Toronto area doing my things and, and again it's nice to get somewhere where you haven't been before and, and uh, come up here and uh, to be a part of this and uh, I know it's a quick over overnight thing but um, a phenomenal day and at the end of it you see the money that's raised and we all know the cause and, and uh, there's nothing better. It means a lot I mean uh, coming from a small town like this um, for our family especially Patrick to be able to give back to uh, a charity in the local area is uh, it's phenomenal and um, especially last night we had a meet and greet with a lot of the sponsors and I got to see a lot of the kids and see the uh, the center was uh, very important and I uh, got to see where the money goes to was uh, definitely uh, exciting for uh, all the sponsors.
Last year, the tournament raised almost $90,000 for the center. This year's total will be announced later tonight. At the 95th PGA Championship near Rochester, New York, a familiar name as the clubhouse lead while Canadian is very much in contention. We've got highlights. We'll start with Brantford, Ontario's David Hearn, who uh, started the opening round with a bogey but settled in nicely after that with a string of birdies. A nice approach shot here would set up the bird as the Canadian would finish at four under par, firing a 66, so that puts him in second place. Four-time champ Tiger Woods with a nice approach shot here, but he would struggle the rest of the way in his round, making only two birdies. The world's top golfer has his work cut out for him, finishing with a one over par 71, so he is six shots off the lead and the lead belongs to Jim Furyk the KG vet is the one to catch in upstate New York opening with a scorching five under par 65 as he nails the long birdie putt other notables Robert Garrigus Paul Casey and Matt Kuchar in a group uh, two shots back that looks like Ryan Benazzo celebrating when he finally gets the ball in the hole you better believe it, you better believe it. Ozzy Adam Scott is uh, still on the course the 33 year old Masters champ is Never won the PGA Championship. It's something he would love to do as he chases his 22nd career tournament title. It's a huge adjustment, just like I went over to the Open early to prepare for the conditions there. A very hard, firm golf course, much firmer underfoot than a course in America. It was great to play here last week in America and, and get back to seeing the ball up in the air a lot more. You play on the ground so much on the link style. Here we're up in the air and in long rough around the greens. It's a different short game skill set that's required here. So adjusting a little bit last week and now kind of getting familiar with the golf course here at Oak Hill in the next three days is very important. Week six in the CFL continues tonight with the Toronto Argonauts hoping to pad their lead atop the East Division in Montreal. The Alouettes have been slow out of the shoot with a two and three record. Ricky Ray is back at quarterback for the Boatman after a one-game absence. At the Rogers Cup in Montreal last night, 11 seed Milos Raonic of Canada blasted his way by Mikhail Yuzny. That may believe missile fired 13 aces as he cruised to a straight sets win in only 74 minutes. Vancouver's Vasek Pospisil eliminated Radic Stepanek in straights, and he would upset Thomas Burdich, the fifth seed this afternoon in three sets. The other three Canadians were sent packing in round two. Frank Dancevic of Niagara Falls fell to Yerzy Janowicz in three. Four seed uh, Rafael Nadal made quick work of Ottawa's Jesse Levine, and Philip Pelowo was ousted by Dennis Istomin. At the Women's Rogers Cup in Toronto, Canada's Sharon Fitchman was no match for Yelena Yankovic, losing in straights. Montreal's Eugenie Bouchard was sent home by defending champ and seventh-ranked Petra Kivitova, while top seed Serena Williams is through to the quarterfinals, topping Francesca Schiavone. And Canada will face Russia Friday in the semifinals of the Ivan Halinka Under-18 tournament. And, of course, Canada did win that tournament Last year, other news, uh, NBA news, uh, former number one overall pick Greg Oden, who has had microfracture knee surgery three times, has uh, signed a one-year contract with the Miami Heat. He was an excellent college player with the Ohio State Buckeyes, but his NBA pro career has been a bust. Everybody a wants to join the Heat right now. Well, something <laughs> I know Holly is excited about tonight, a live double eviction on Big Brother mm -hmm. with more. Here's Teletalk. Tonight on Global Thunder Bay, we prove that if you want to win big, you've got to take a risk. Starting at 8, it's the finale of The Winner Is, and someone's going home with a million dollars. Then at 9 on Big Brother, it's time to say goodbye to someone with tonight's live eviction. And at 10 p.m. on Rookie Blue, a casino-bound bus full of seniors is robbed at gunpoint. Over on CKPR Thunder Bay, we get up close and personal with nature and our history. First at 8, The Nature of Things has the story of a young polar bear's first summer without his mother. Then at 9, it's part 2 of the documentary Love, Hate and Propaganda, The War on Terror. Teletalk is brought to you by Points, the traffic ticket specialists.
Well, we saw earlier in sports that the Little League action did continue this afternoon. Rain wasn't an issue like it was a few nights ago. Sarah, is that going to be an issue tonight for the uh, final game? Well, it doesn't look like it will be an issue, um, at least for the games tonight. We could have a bit of uh, pop-up activity a bit, little bit later on, but hopefully the games will be wrapped up by then. Today we uh, got up to 20 degrees, mostly cloudy skies, but not much in terms of precipitation. Wind coming from the west-northwest, and it was a bit blustery with those winds uh, gusting anywhere from 4 at the very low end to uh, 36 kilometers per hour. Across the country today, beautiful and sunny in British Columbia. Vancouver is still sitting at 22 degrees, 26 in Prince George. Alberta, a bit more cloud cover and much cooler. Calgary right now sitting at 15 degrees, which is uh, quite below seasonal for this time of year. In the prairies, also below seasonal, 17 degrees right now and a bit of cloud cover in Regina. Winnipeg, windy with those gusts uh, up to about 40 kilometers per hour today. And uh, they're currently sitting at 18 degrees under partly cloudy skies. We take a look at Toronto. Uh, seasonal, slightly warmer with the humidity, but not too warm, maybe about 33 degrees with that humidity. Pleasant, a uh, bit of sun and cloud in Ottawa, Montreal. A bit cloudier up in Quebec City. Rainfall warnings in northern parts of Quebec today. Uh, so that's something that they are definitely watching out for. Uh, we take a look onto the east coast. Those winds will be picking up tonight in Halifax, currently sitting at 20 degrees. 16 in Fredericton. Uh, cloudy, a bit of fog overnight tonight. Charlottetown, 21 degrees, a bit of cloud, and 19 in St. John's, which is an improvement over uh, yesterday's temperatures. We can see uh, in our area today, quite clear, we had a bit of uh, cloud cover into tomorrow that could bring that pop-up precipitation, but most likely short-lived. Uh, as we head into the weekend, those clear skies should be uh, continuing with not much in terms of wet weather. Overnight tonight across the region, now a bit cooler up in Big Trout Lake at six degrees, warmer down in Kenora, Dryden, 10, but still quite chilly for this time of year. Overnight tonight, Sault Ste. Marie looking to dip down to about 12 degrees and a bit of shower activity uh, pretty much across the board. For tomorrow, those temperatures uh, still below seasonal across the region. Mid to high teens in most areas. Looks like the warmest will be down in Sault Ste. Marie at 20 degrees. Then to be at this hour, we're currently sitting at 18 degrees under partly cloudy sky. So perfect right now if you're uh, planning, to, planning to head out and watch a baseball game. There's a couple of them going on. Winds coming from the northwest, still a bit blustery, gusting up to about 29 kilometers per hour. Then right tonight dropping down to about 10 degrees. This is where we could see that passing shower and cooling off. Um, good news is not any electrical activity associated with that. Wind shifting from the west southwest and dying down a bit to about 24 kilometers per hour there. Uh, to start your day off tomorrow, partly cloudy, but cooler around 8 o'clock in the morning at 11 degrees. By noon, should be about 16. Still some sun and cloud. That risk of a passing shower is still likely by about uh, just before supper time at 4 o'clock and 18 degrees by that time. As we get a little bit closer to the weekend, uh, on Saturday, quite pleasant and Going above the 20 degree mark, 23 degrees expected. On Sunday, partly sunny, more sun than cloud, 22 degrees expected. Nice as well to start off your week on Monday with a high of 22, a bit cooler, maybe overnight dipping down to about 7 degrees. And Tuesday, also quite sunny to start off that work week. But that's your weather forecast. So many people on summer vacation, your workplace is probably looking a little emptier than usual these days. Same goes for Canadian Blood Services. Donations are down and that could become a real concern. More on that from Jennifer Palasok. On a bright summer's day, Aaron Dugan is indoors, giving blood. You know, if something were to ever happen to me or anyone else, that, 
you know, my blood could be useful to save a life. She's among the few donating. It's just a way of giving back. I'm O negative, so I'm a universal donor, so anybody can take my blood. Usually these chairs are filled, but officials say with summer holidays, many are sitting empty as donating blood isn't top of mind. The challenge is that demand does not decrease in the summer. Patients don't take a holiday, they still require blood products. Inventory levels are at 20,000 units of blood. That's 5,000 less than normal. If we continue to see this appointment gap, it could potentially put a strain on our national inventory because demand continues. So they've put out the blood signal, alerting followers on social media and all Canadians that donations are needed. An accident victim potentially could use up 50 units of blood or blood products. Someone undergoing chemotherapy or cancer treatment could need up to five donors to support them through their treatment. 50% of Canadians can donate, but the other half are not eligible due to health concerns where they've travelled or they have to wait. For example, you can't donate for six months after receiving a tattoo or piercing. You have to wait a few days if you've had dental treatment. Gay men must be celibate for five years before donating. Also, you have to weigh at least 110 pounds. Officials say it's for donor safety. What I would suggest is each person call one 888 to donate, ask to speak to a nurse, and then speak to them about your unique situation, and they will let you know if you're eligible or not to donate. About 33,000 units of blood are needed in Ontario alone. So the Canadian Blood Services are extending clinic hours and opening up more beds, hoping to fill them to meet that need. So we'd like to see our clinics filled completely um, every day right through to Labor Day. Summer shortage concerns putting blood donation higher on the to-do list. My mind is I'm going to call all my friends and tell them to come and donate this month. Jennifer Palasok, Global News. Well, you're probably going to have to wait a couple months for the new commemorative Randy Sheffy coin. I'm sure that'll be in circulation uh, in the near future. But fortunately, you don't have to wait for a coin featuring the royal baby. We'll have that story for you right after the break.
Well, another tribute for England's new Prince George, this time from Ottawa. Today, the Canadian Mint unveiled a collection of new pieces to commemorate the birth of England's future king, who was born on July 22nd. This 25-cent piece is called Royal Infant Carriage. It will set you back $25. That seems worth it. A set of three $20 coins are called Sweet Dreams, Tender Bonds, and A Hopeful Future. The coins are made of pure silver. Ottawa has limited the mintage to 15,000 coins worldwide. Quite the collectors. I have a feeling they're going to go fast. They probably know? will. Yeah. yeah. We're going to recap our top story. Well, the federal government announced a $6 million deal for Matawa First Nations members to receive training for the Ring of Fire's mining sector. And over at Baseball Central, the Canadian Senior Little League uh, Baseball Championships come to a close tonight with the host Thunder Bay Selects taking on the Cape Breton Cubs. We'll have highlights of that. And the Border Cats continue their homestand over at Port Arthur Stadium against the Woodchucks from Wisconsin. And that'll do it for your early look at news, weather, and sports. Remember, for news on demand, log on to TV News Watch. In the meantime, we'll see you tomorrow.